Awesome. So for anyone who hasn't met Dana or didn't join the uh, the previous kind of get to know Dana chat that we had, um, she's from the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission. And she's been there for just over 10 years, I believe. And yeah, we're super excited to have her. She was supposed to come last April and then because of COVID that had to get bumped. So we're very excited that we got matched again this year. Um, yeah, and we're looking forward to hearing about resilient planning and everything that goes into that as it yeah relates to engineering and how we need to work with planners and earthquake prep and risk management and everything that is very relevant in both San Francisco and the Victoria area. So yeah, with that, I'll just pass on over to Dana. Great, thanks. Nice. Oh, there's some feedback there. Not sure where that's coming. Okay, there we go. Um, so I'm a planner by training, and um, I like I worked have worked for the past ten years doing planning and policy at a regional scale. Um, and in that time, I've worked with a lot of engineers, um, and so my my approach to resilience and earthquake risk reduction is really that there are building blocks that start um, at an individual and a building and a, up to a, a neighborhood, um, community, city, regional, and state scale that all sort of work together to build resilience. So I'm going to talk to you about projects that I've worked on, the concepts that I use pretty much daily in my job, and how those all sort of build together to build up to um, resilient regions, which is the scale that I work at most, uh, most often. So here are the EERI slides. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with EERI since this is the EERI student chapter, um, but I'll talk a little bit about my experience with EERI. Um, I think when I first started working in the earthquake risk reduction world, I was a bit intimidated by EERI because it has the word engineer in the title, um, but I have really appreciated the fact that it's a really wide variety of, um, of types of professionals that participate in EERI. It's very multidisciplinary, and I will say that everything I know about engineering, I learned through EERI. So the mission statement of EERI is to reduce earthquake risk. Uh, there's a lot about the um, science and practice of earthquake engineering. That's not really my jam, but the other two are, which is improving understanding of the impact of earthquakes on the physical, social, economic, political, and cultural environment, and advocating uh, for comprehensive and realistic measures for reducing the harmful effects of earthquakes. So all of these are true for what I have gotten out of EERI. Um, I've met so many people through EERI, and I've had um, some actually really amazing experiences, which I'll talk to you about in, in the next slide. I have traveled to different, multiple different countries on EERI's dime. Um, and I've learned so much. Like, as I said, I, everything I know about engineering, earthquake engineering, I've learned through EERI. And also had a lot of leadership opportunities through EERI. So my, how I got involved in EERI, um, the first thing I did actually is uh, when I was in my early career, somebody randomly forwarded me the opportunity to do some research in Christchurch, New Zealand. And it was a program through the World Bank that, uh, in, that was in partnership with EERI. Um, and they wanted people to go and uh, work um, do, just walk around and analyze what the impact of the closure of the downtown after the um, earthquakes there were having on the economy. And I just kind of on a whim threw in my application and I was one of two people selected to go. So this was incredible. I was like, oh, why did they select me? I was like, you know, barely out of grad school, but it was such an incredible experience. And I learned so much about the intersection between buildings and the way that buildings perform and the impacts that that can have on all of these different systems, um, like social systems, um, economic systems, and how, you know, the, the fact that only a few buildings in the downtown central business district 
were severely impacted and had like major structural damage. But the ripple effects of that were so wide um, because, uh, because those, those buildings um, had impacts on the buildings next door. They had impacts on the functions of the entire business district. And then it had ripple effects to the society as a whole. Um, so after that wonderful experience, I uh, was invited to join the Northern California chapter board in 2015. I started as just a board member. I quickly became the secretary treasurer and then was elected president of the board, um, which I recently retired from that um, this past year. And that was wonderful because we were able to plan a lot of great lectures and events. And the fact that I was um, not an engineer meant that I brought a uh, perspective and I brought in a lot of people that I knew that um, other people on the board did not know that were looking at things from a little bit of different perspective, more of a resilience approach. Um, so we brought together a lot of people who maybe wouldn't have mixed otherwise. I liked my experience with EERI so much that I applied to become a Hausner Fellow and joined the class of 2017. This is one of the most amazing things that I have done so far in my career. Um, if you are selected to become a Hausner Fellow, you start with a uh, leadership retreat and you learn so much about how to be a leader and how you are already a leader. And then you do a two-year project with your cohort. And our project was to look at the role of, of the concept of resilience, so community resilience, in reconnaissance and how EERI can better support that. And we did that through going down to Mexico and looking at the recovery from uh, the Mexico earthquake of 2017. So I already kind of went over this, but who EERI has a wide variety of members, geoscientists, en engineers, um, planners, social scientists, public officials, emergency managers, um, and they do a wide variety of research, uh, research scientists, practicing professionals, um, academics, um, all sorts of folks. Some of the things that EERI does is the School Earthquake Safety Initiative. Um, and th this is a really cool program that not only looks, teaches um, government officials and schools how to evaluate their schools for safety, but also has a educational program that teaches elementary school kids about um, seismic safety. So you can see here, they're learning the very early fundamentals of earthquake engineering. Uh, the Learning from Earthquakes program is one that I have participated in. Uh, this, is, um, this program sends multidisciplinary teams out into the field after earthquakes, um, does reconnaissance. This is the program that is most closely associated with the Hausner project that I worked on. And we were looking at how to expand reconnaissance um, above and beyond just looking at building performance. And there's a huge amount of data that is available through the Learning from Earthquakes program. And I also participated in uh, reconnaissance in the 2014 South Napa earthquake, which is close to where I live. I got to um, crawl around under mobile homes and see what kind of damage um, happened there. They also have a travel study program. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this, but this is really designed for uh, early career practicing engineers. This is a super great opportunity because you get sent on a week long field study um, to look firsthand at how earthquakes have affected regions around the world. Um, they train you on reconnaissance. You get to meet people in the communities. It's just a really great opportunity. So if you um, ever have an opportunity to apply to this, I highly recommend it. Um, I don't, you guys are the student chapter, so I'm not sure I need to tell you what the benefits of student membership is. Uh, the Friedman Family Visiting Professionals Program. You have these uh, competitions, seismic design, student papers, graduate fellowships, um, travel grants to the EERI annual meeting, although the last one is online, and online access to all that EERI has to offer. What can you do after graduation? There are a lot of uh, initiatives that EERI has that are geared towards younger members. The Young Members Committee is super great. I know the people who lead that and they're very vibrant and active in the work that they do. There are regional chapters um, all over the place. 
Um, you can be a mentor, you can do a postgraduate internship. And I, again, I highly recommend um, joining the next LFE travel study trip. So here are the regional chapters. Um, if you are not, if once you graduate, if you are in any of these locations, um, join a chapter. So student members get your first year of your young professional membership free and reduced rates for the next four years. So I highly recommend that you take advantage of that after you graduate. And EERI makes everybody smile. Look at all those smiling people. Okay, um, so what I'm gonna talk about today, um, again, I said I, I'm, I'm gonna talk about the key concepts that I rely on every day on how to build regional resilience, um, how cities and regions plan for resilience, um, oh, actually, I took out that stuff about disaster recovery. And then I'm going to go through a couple of projects that I have worked on that are on the ground examples of projects of different scales and that address different hazards that are really these building blocks that add up to regional resilience. So I'll go over my background a little bit. Um, my undergraduate degree is in architecture. So um, although I'm not an engineer, I am no stranger to building design. Uh, I got that degree from University of California, Berkeley. So I am in the San Francisco Bay Area now. I've spent most of my life in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, except for the two years that I got my master's in urban planning from Harvard Graduate School of Design. Went to the East Coast, I thought it was really cold, and I came back. Um, my early interest before I took a couple of years off between undergrad and grad was in sustainability. I worked on a lot of green building rating systems and things like that. And that really led to an interest in climate change. Um, when I was in grad school, I did a lot of work on, on that. And then on a whim, I took a class on disaster recovery in New Orleans. And I got to go to New Orleans and um, look at how they were recovering from Hurricane Katrina. And I was totally hooked. It was fascinating. I was just like, this is incredible. Uh, this is so interesting. The fact that we can help people do this better is just amazing. So I got an internship with the city of San Francisco and I got a crash course in earthquakes because that is the major hazard that they were planning for in San Francisco at the time. And that was 10 years ago. And since then I've been working at um, regional agencies. I'm on my third regional agency as a resilience planner. I've worked on earthquakes, I've worked on wildfires, and I'm now um, mostly focused on sea level rise adaptation. So this is the Bay Area, it's very beautiful. Uh, we have a lot of shoreline, um, we have a lot of greenery, quite beautiful, quite pretty. Everybody loves living here, even though it's very expensive. Um, but look at all those faults. We have lots of faults in the Bay Area. Um, so that means that we are constantly at risk for earthquakes. There have been um, some major earthquakes in the Bay Area, most famously uh, the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco. Um, we also had a, a relatively large earthquake in 1989, although the epicenter for that was um, down in Santa Cruz, which is off this map. So it wasn't the big one. Uh, we are overdue for a big one. So it's really beneficial for the Bay Area to plan for that. We, we have small earthquakes all the time also. Um, but in addition to earthquakes, we also have flooding. Um, this is a picture of what sea level rise could look like in the future. This is at 66 inches of flooding, um, which could, is probably not going to occur for another 100 years or so, knock on wood, um, hopefully. But it's a lot of flooding. This is, incidentally is a online flood explorer mapping tool that my program has created and is available for the public to look at to see if their house is going to be underwater in 100 years. And we also have a lot of fires, uh, wildfires, um, especially in the past few years. So this is just a snapshot of wildfires that were occurring, I think this is 2020, maybe 2019, but these were all active wildfires that were occurring at the same time. So um, there's a lot to study here. There's a lot to work on and there's a lot of work to be done. There's no lack of, of work here in the Bay Area around resilience. So my, my approach to resilience is um, I think obviously it's a multi-hazards approach. Um, you cannot look at any hazard in a vacuum. 
Um, you can't, you know, just look at earthquakes and say we're done. Um, you have to look at how it intersects with the other hazards and how to plan for them all at the same time. This is especially true uh, around the Bay shoreline, which we have a lot of like marshy areas. We have a lot of Bay fill, which I'll talk about in, in a little bit, um, where you have sort of the twin hazards of uh, liquefaction and sea level rise. I think a lot about um, the intersection between slow moving and fast moving disasters, which I'll talk about in a second. And then I think a lot about all these different tools that we have and how they intersect. Um, all these tools like building codes, zoning codes, policies, plans, and how they um, can go through this whole cycle of mitigation or strengthening, um, getting prepared for a disaster, um, planning for recovery or some altered state, and then managing recovery or rebuilding or reimagining. I think a lot about resilient at different scales, as I mentioned, starting from the individual, um, building, community, city, and region. And then lastly, people. Um, so I have thought a lot about the fact that, you know, if earthquakes happened and nobody was there, it's kind of like, a, you know, if, if a tree falls in the forest, does anyone hear it? If an earthquake happens and no one's there, does it even matter? No. Um, if an earthquake happens and a building falls down and no one's there and no one lives in it, does it matter? No. People are why we do all of this. And protecting communities is critical. And this doesn't just mean protecting them in terms of life safety, but protecting communities and community cohesion, and especially the communities that are most at risk and have the fewest resources. So equity and environmental justice is a big piece of why I do what I do. So how do I define regional resilience? Um, regional resilience to me is is an attribute of, of human organizations, not, not buildings. Um, so a community can be resilient, a region can be resilient, a building can be strong, but it's not resilient. Um, resilience can be measured over time or against a baseline. So resilience can fluctuate, it can improve, it can worsen. Um, resilience can respond to some sort of slow or fast moving disaster. Um, and to me, resilience includes an element of reimagining. Um, so you can be resilient to a disaster, but if you're just kind of like, you have a disaster and you build back and it's the same as it was before and it's just going to be, um, it's just gonna fall down again, that's not resilient because you haven't improved upon the situation. And then a big component of regional resilience obviously is these building blocks at different scales. And I, I, I look at this and I had sort of mentioned this, like you have your natural environment. If an earthquake happens and there's no one around, who cares? You have your built environment, which layers on top of that. And then the human element is what's on top. That's the basic structure of a community. What should we be resilient to? Um, I mentioned this fast moving disasters and slow moving disasters um, to me, a uh, fast moving disaster is a sudden disaster event with a clear before and after. This is something like wildfire, earthquake, or flood event. Uh, a slow moving disaster is nearly imperceptible changes over a long period of time that will fundamentally alter the environment. The examples of this are sea level rise and drought. And um, slow moving disasters can be punctuated by fast moving disasters, or they can exacerbate fast moving disasters. So for example, Sea level rise exacerbates storm surge events and drought exacerbates wildfires. So you have all these hazards, you saw the maps, there's a lot going on in the Bay Area. What's the toolkit of how we address this in the region and, and how, it, how does it build up over scale? The resilience planning and policy toolkit starts at the building scale and um, flows all the way up to the state and actually to the federal level, but I left that out because it's sort of the smallest piece of the puzzle. And a lot of this is addressed through plans and policies. And that starts at the building scale through building codes. Um, and building codes can be adapted like citywide. Um, it doesn't have to be the same as the state. You can have a stronger building code in, in your city based on your particular risk. So cities have control over building codes. They also have control over zoning codes. And this really says, you know, where you build to what density. 
Um, they also can plan out specific areas um, within their city to a very, very um, detailed level saying this is gonna be built here, it's gonna be built this way, um, this is gonna be open space or not. Um, and then you have general plans, which is something that every city in California has. And general plans have all sorts of different elements. And this plans out, you know, for example, they have a housing element. This plans out how housing is going to grow. There's a safety element, which addresses how the city handles all of these threats to safety. So you can use your general plan to outline these strategies for um, how you're going to make all of those more resilient. Then just to complicate things, you have your local hazard mitigation plans, which is um, something that is actually uh, required by FEMA, um, which is federal. It's all very interwoven. And um, that requires you to look at all of your hazards that you have uh, in your community and come up with a plan to address them. But local hazard mitigation plans are historically very backcasting. So they look, they ask you to look at what hazards you have had in your community. They don't necessarily ask you to, to forward cast. Um, so they've historically been more sort of focused on past flooding events and earthquake events, not necessarily sea level rise or things that are going to be worse in the future. You can plan for recovery. Um, you can, you know, set up all of these systems that you think you're going to have to have in place if a disaster occurs. Um, as opposed to a local hazard mitigation plan, which is backcasting, many cities now have adaptations plans, which are forward um, looking, moving up on the scale. There are um, regional plans, although in the Bay Area, there are very few regional plans. And this is largely because land use is a local authority. We The regional agencies have really no authority at all. We have some permitting authority in my agency, but that's about it. So um, one of our regional agencies has the authority to sort of make a suggested plan for where new growth should go in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And that's really, you know, making sure that new, um, new jobs and housing are near uh, transit so that people don't drive to their jobs. And then we have our state local hazard mitigation and adaptation plans. So that's sort of the toolkit of plans and policies. And then we have sort of um, some mechanisms that, that get you to those tools. We have our legal mechanisms, which are we call our sticks. Those are things like local ordinances to pass laws to change those plans, regional measures, state legislation that enacts laws that, that tell you you have to change those, those um, plans and policies. And then there's federal legislation. And then we have voluntary mechanisms, um, incentives, carrots, champions. You know, we have someone who just wakes up one day and says, oh my gosh, we really need to do something about this earthquake hazard. And they just like run around telling everyone that, you know, we need to do something about that. And, and they just have enough sway that they get things done. Um, or, and, and then these champions can also put political pressure or peer pressure on others to also do these things. So these, this, is, this is the toolkit that we use in the Bay Area to get things done. What do we do? Um, this is, these are the buckets. Understand risk, you know, what hazards or threats exist. What are the community's vulnerabilities? We tell people to plan ahead, you know, envision a desired outcome and how you want to get there. We pressure pressure people um, to reduce risk through changing the built environment um, and changing or and or changing the policy and planning environment. And then we ask them to respond to changes. So changing course based on your impacts and or recovering from in impacts. So the way this plays out in a fast moving disaster is to understand risk. You would do your local hazard mitigation plan. You would have a vulnerability assessment in that. To plan ahead in your local hazard mitigation plan, you would have a number of strategies. You may also have a pre-disaster recovery plan that would you know, outline how you would recover from the disaster. To reduce risk, you would maybe have a retrofit ordinance that passes a law that says that everybody who has a, a certain kind of building has to retrofit it. You might um, change your zoning to reduce density in a high risk area. And then once the disaster hits um, and you respond to changes, you would enact your recovery plan and you might have some sort of emergency ordinance that like 
for example, accelerates um, the issuance of building permits or something like that. In a slow moving disaster, to understand risk, you'd probably have your vulnerability assessment in something like an adaptation plan. You'd also have your strategies in an adaptation plan. Um, to reduce risk, you'd probably zone to reduce density in high risk areas. So you can see that's the same in a faster slow moving disaster. And you might plan for like large scale infrastructure projects in a capital plan. And then to respond to changes, you just kind of do incremental zoning updates as needed. So I'm going to go through some projects now um, that I think illustrate how we have built some of these building blocks for resilient regions. Um, and the first one is a soft story a policy document model ordinance, which is building resilience through buildings. Stronger housing, safer communities is building resilience through um, policy. The Regional Resilience Toolkit is building resilience through city processes, how they go through this process. Um, Art Bay Area is building resilience through regional assessment. And Art Bay Adapt is building resilience through regional coordination. And don't worry, I only have like a few slides on each of these. So the soft story model ordinance and program development. Um, this is a document that documents that I put together to help cities get to an outcome of retrofit. We have these soft story buildings in the Bay Area. They're quite common and they're quite um, damaging. Um, and so we thought that this was a good place to start because they, re they represent a large proportion of the structural risk in the Bay Area. So we developed model policy so that it would be easier for cities to adopt it. And then we um, gave them a lot of guidance on how to decide uh, how to adjust it to fit their particular needs. And then this uh, other companion document, the Soft Story Retrofit Program Development document, provides instructions on how to do a whole soft story program. So it's you don't just adopt a policy and then boom, it's done. You have to first do an evaluation of how many soft story buildings you have. This usually involves, you know, doing a, a sidewalk study, um, mailing out surveys to people. And then you have to um, pass the ordinance. You have to do a lot of political um, laying the groundwork for that. And then you have to, you have to um, make sure that there's compliance for this. And often there's a grant program involved. So there's a whole um, program that goes along with this ordinance. So some of the things that we laid out here, and these are these are how um, you know what what could be a very basic like how do you upgrade a building um, can be seen in the context of a larger city resilience uh, context, and those are considerations like you know which buildings should be targeted, all soft story buildings or just the worst, just the oldest, um, just the ones that contain the most critical services, um, just the largest? How do you decide? What degree of mitigation should be required? Is it life safety? Is it above life safety? Can all buildings even reach life safety, especially the older buildings? How should the program be phased? Who should go first? Should it be the biggest buildings? Should it be the oldest buildings? Should it be those most at risk? What are the impacts to building owners and tenants? Who pays? Um, you know, if it's a residential building, does the building owner pass those costs along to the tenants? If so, are those, can those tenants afford it? Who might be disproportionately impact, impacted? Does the city need 100% compliance to reach functional recovery? What happens if 20% of the building owners just don't comply? Is that okay? Is the city still going to function? Who's impacted by that? And then how do you apply engineering standards to functional recovery standards? So how do you decide to what degree um, people need to, um, to what level of performance um, you need to apply um, your engineering standards? So another project that I worked on is called um, Stronger Housing, Safer Communities. And this analyzes the risk to housing and socially vulnerable communities from earthquakes and flood and then has a huge strategy manual that has ideas for how um, to use planning and policy tools to mitigate risk for existing housing and areas of planned housing. So some of the considerations that we looked at in this project was 
you know, how are socially vulnerable communities disproportionately impacted by hazards? This is the first time we really dug into this issue. What makes a community vulnerable? What are the characteristics that make them especially vulnerable to hazards? Um, and what policies or programs can help protect them? What's the difference? How do you handle existing housing and intact communities versus new development? How are those strategies different? Um, we looked um, at how do you pay for hazard mitigation? It's very hard to pay for it. You know, is the onus on the people who, who privately own those buildings or is it on government? Um, how do you help communities prepare for disaster recovery? So I'm not talking about the cities, but the people who live in it. How do you build their social, um, their like social capacity to, to respond to a disaster? And then how do you engage communities to actively participate in disaster planning? So this, this regional resilience toolkit was designed to lay out a stepwise process um, to that helps cities um, basically develop an, uh, not just an adaptation plan, but it's a generalized process that um, you can use for a local hazard mitigation plan, you can use it for an adaptation plan, um, but it starts with engaging communities, um, shows you how to assess risk and vulnerability, identify and prioritize strategies, fund the action that needs to take that needs to be taken because identifying strategies is not enough, you actually have to enact them, and then evaluating those results and adjusting course based on how that goes. And one thing that was very cool about this is that it had a whole companion document that had worksheets that helped the users walk through the process. So it wasn't just, here's what you do, it's here's what you do, and here's a worksheet that actually helps you do it. So the considerations we were going through on this one was, um, can you use a common process for multiple hazards? We thought that the answer was yes, and that's what we were trying to lay out. Um, one, one criticism we had of things like the local hazard mitigation plan process was that you had to go through, uh, it, was, it was too siloed. You had to go through multiple processes just to get for different hazards, just to get to the same outcome. We also thought that um, planning for hazards was, shouldn't be that separate from daily planning. Um, ideas. So how do you streamline and incorporate this process into daily planning processes rather than, you know, make the effort to do it completely separately? Who needs to be involved in planning for resilience and why? Um, so plan, you know, is it just city planners? No. Um, it's community. It's, you know, the engineering community. It's uh, elected officials. It's, uh, there's, it's, um, landowners. It's, um, uh, business owners. Everybody has a role to play. Um, but what role should each of them play and why? Um, should resilience planning be an ongoing iterative process? Do you do it once and you're done? If so, why? If not, why? And then lastly, why is this so hard to fund? Um, and how can we be strategic about funding resilience? And I will tell you that um, one of the things that we ran into is that funding tends to be extremely siloed um, you can you, you know, can get tiny amounts of money for a very specific type of project, um, but you have to stack a lot of different sources of funding to do this whole process from start to finish. All right, I'm going to pause and take a little sip of water. So I'm going to turn to sea level rise adaptation now, and then I will pause and we can have a little chat. So this is a big project that I finished, that me and my team finished last year, and it was a region-wide assessment of sea level rise vulnerability and what it was going to do to the region, what the consequences would be to the region. So first give you a little bit of context. Um, the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission is, we're a state agency, but we work regionally in the San Francisco Bay, and we're a coastal management agency which means that um, we manage the Bay shoreline um, by issuing permits for uh, development projects along the shoreline. But we also have a big planning side, which is where I am. And we work in, in partnership with the outer coast, the um, agencies that manage the outer coast. 
So BCDC was created in 1965 to manage unregulated fill of the San Francisco Bay. The, the bay was shrinking. So you can see here on the images in 1849, the bay was much bigger than it is today. 1965 is when BCDC was created. And that basically locked in the size of the bay. Um, but they were anticipating at the time that if fill was occurring at the same rate that it was occurring at the time, that by 2020, it would basically be a river. Um, but now we're kind of facing the opposite problem. So rather than the bay being filled, it's sort of reclaiming its, its rightful place. So I think it's quite interesting that this map of, of sea level rise looks eerily similar to the map of 1849. So the, the bay is just kind of finding itself again. So the program that I lead, which is called the Adapting to Rising Tides program, is we really address this issue of, OK, now what? We were created to deal with one problem, and now we're looking at the opposite problem. So we did a lot of, we do a lot of study to look at this. Art Bay Area was the project that we um, created that looks at these four systems. We looked at um, systems that were interconnected throughout the Bay, uh, including transportation networks, vulnerable communities, future growth areas, which are areas that were designated for um, jobs and housing, and natural lands. We have a lot of um, wetlands along our shoreline, we have a lot of park systems, and we have some ag areas as well. So what we wanted to know was what gets wet within each system, where are these impacts worst around the region, where are their high consequence assets, and where are they co-located around the region, and then what are the big issues that are common or pressing across the region. The slide takes, okay. So this shows you the interconnectedness of all of the system that we looked at across the region. The orange is transportation. The blue, which you can't really see, is where all the vulnerable communities are. The green is natural and open space. And then um, the bright blue is uh, priority development areas, which are the areas of jobs and, and growth. And so we knew that you know, not, not only were these networks sort of networked each network was connected across the region, but the overlaid, they occupied a lot of the same space. What we did, um, in, in addition to looking at just exposure, is we developed 32 different indicators of consequence across all four of the systems. And I'm not going to go into these in any really meaningful way, um, but they are things like, for example, for highways, we looked at average annual daily traffic. Um, so if a portion of freeway got flooded, we looked at how many truck or how many vehicles passed over that portion of freeway, and that was our measure of consequence. Um, so we looked at those for all of our transportation assets. We looked at things like um, residential units and job spaces now and in 2040. We looked at things like stormwater retention, um, acres of habitat, um, dollar value of crops in agricultural areas, things like that. And then we also looked at what we called hot spots, which are areas with um, multiple assets that have the amongst the highest consequences in the region. So they had a high consequence transportation asset, a vulnerable block group, and either a top five priority development area, which is um, future jobs and housing, or a natural area, which are called priority conservation areas. So these are the areas across the region that um, are where we have high consequence assets, assets that are co-located. And these point to areas where um, it might be wise to focus our adaptation efforts because we can protect a lot of really important things at once. And then um, we have some key planning issues, which are cross-cutting issues the region has to, should act on together. These are things like there are a lot of areas in the region where um, different types of transportation come together and all flood at the same time. For example, um, in San Francisco, there's a spot where there's a ferry terminal, regional rail, local bus lines, roadways, and major bike and pedestrian routes all in one spot and it all gets wet at once. We have a huge, um, hugely complicated ownership, governance, management, and regulatory landscape that complicates everything. Um, we have this complex interconnected um, basically landscape between uh, this long-term um, disaster and short-term disasters and how we manage emergency 
and critical service functions, uh, like what would happen if an earthquake occurred. We have a lot of contamination issues. We have old military bases, um, naval bases. We don't know what's gonna happen when those are um, flooded. We have a lot of housing issues already. What's sea level rise going to do to an already really tight housing market? Um, where we plan new housing is really critical. Um, if we put housing in areas that are, are high hazard, um, we're just gonna make our region less resilient. But if we're smart about where we put it, then we can make our region more resilient. And we have, um, along our Bay shoreline, we have a lot of habitat, but we also have a lot of recreation. And as sea levels rise, it's gonna put a real crunch on um, choosing between habitat and recreation. And trust me, there are very vocal um, people on either side of that debate. And then, you know, we have 10 years basically to preserve our wetlands before they all drown. Um, so that's something that we have to do now. That's the canary in the coal mine. That's our, our number one issue um, as, as sea levels rise. We also did 32 local qualitative assessments that I won't go into here, but this was kind of a, a deep dive. We, we looked at, okay, so we have all these different types of assets. How are they interconnected? Who lives there? Um, what are these assets? And we did this massive deep dive into literally hundreds of assets in the Bay Area. So lastly, um, this is sort of the biggest scale project that I'm going to be talking about. And it's really kind of um, squishy and it's about coordination. And it, this project is called Bay Adapt. And um, so we have all this information about what is what the issues are, um, what's gonna get wet, where, what's high consequence. Um, and then how do we actually do something about it? How do we come together and decide what the region as a whole does? So BCDC and the art team has pulled together literally hundreds of stakeholders to decide as, as a region, what are the actions that are necessary um, in the Bay Area to protect from sea level rise? Um, local action is, is going to make up most of what happens in terms of adaptation. It's where we, it's where land use control happens. It's where infrastructure is built. Um, it's where, you know, wetlands restoration occurs. It's where shoreline protection is built. And lots of that is already happening. Um, but we were starting to see that um, all this stuff wasn't really adding up. You know, certain communities, wealthy communities were doing things and, and, less lower capacity communities weren't able to. Um, we also have a closed base system. So uh, if, if somebody builds a major seawall, the community next to them could actually see more flooding and more wave run up. Um, we also saw that you know, there wasn't enough wetlands being built fast enough, um, you know, jobs and businesses, people cross jurisdictional boundaries all the time. And we really just didn't know what it was adding up to. So Bay Adapt is, we're really, you know, we developed some guiding principles so that we could all agree on, on how, what we want the region to look like when we've successfully adapted to sea level rise. Um, we're in the midst of developing a joint platform. This is a document that has our shared priority actions. And then we're asking all of our leaders in the region to adopt it and basically commit to uh, implementing the joint platform together. So the way that we've done this is we have a leadership advisory group. We've had a number of public forums. We've had working groups to help us brainstorm all of these barriers. What are the big issues? What are the solutions? You know, what are these actions? What should they be? And then we've presented all over the region to community groups, elected officials, and we've come up with this draft of the joint platform. Here it is. I'm definitely not going to get into this, but um, basically these are the actions that we think are going to get us to adaptation. Um, where we are in this is we're working on the second draft of the joint platform right now, and we're hoping to get it adopted this summer. Um, so that that is the end of what I have, I promise. Um, I'll pause right now. If you have questions, you can ask them to me right now, but here's my email address as well if you think of something later. Um, but I also just wanted to pose some questions for you and see if, you know, anything in my presentation relates to the way that you think about resilience or your career. And was there anything in my presentation that you thought was particularly 
interesting or new. So I'll stop sharing my screen so we can look at each other. Thanks, Jenna, for the presentation. I think uh, it's very fascinating um, coming from somebody who's actually involved with such um, big projects and then which are kind of shown as uh, examples across cities. Uh, we know that in, in Vancouver, we have a seismic policy that's uh, coming up in, in a couple of, um, probably by the end of this year, probably the first draft. Um, one thing that, uh, I, I, before anybody has any questions, I, I have a question about the funding issues that you highlighted. Um, why do you think is the problem? I, I mean, if everybody understands the problem uh, with sea level rise and earthquake risk and all of that, uh, what is the what is the barrier in kind of getting a streamlined funding for uh, the programs that, that that has been worked by the city or other agencies? I think there are a couple, um, and I, I think there are some proposals in the state this year that are probably, if they're successful, if if they go through, I think they're going to be much better. Um, they just haven't. You know, so far the existing funding sources haven't been that successful. Um, one of the challenges is that people like projects. Um, they like things that are proven. They like good investments. They like shovel ready projects. Nobody likes to pay for planning. Um, so there's been a lot of money for, for things that are ready to go. And most people are not there yet. And um, a lot of things like, um, that are, um, I, I'm talking about this in the context of adaptation right now, but I, I think there are totally other sets of barriers when it comes to things like seismic. Um, but the other thing is some people are much better at advocating. Some cities are better at advocating for money than others. Um, one of my staff recently did an analysis of the per capita money um, by city that cities are able to get from the state and it ranged from zero dollars to like hundreds of dollars per capita. So that's a really wide, or thousands, I think even, it's a really wide range of the ability of the city to get money. Um, in, in the seismic world, it's been a huge challenge because there's this weird perception that we have it fixed. Um, we, you know, there's been a statewide policy on seismic issues for decades and um, legislators think it's done. Uh, so they don't want to propose legislation that would take resources from the state because they don't think it would be popular. They're elect, you know, they're elected officials just like, and they want to be popular among their constituents. So they're not going to propose something that they think would make them unpopular. And so if the public perception is that it's not needed, they're certainly not going to propose it because no one would vote for it. Um, so that's kind of a grab bag of reasons, but the truth is, is there is a grab bag of reasons for why this is not, you know, being funded the way it should be. And in, in California, we have a really terrible residential tax structure um, called Prop 13 that really, really, really severely limits um, the amount of property tax that cities can collect. Um, yeah, thanks for the presentation. Um, definitely there's pieces of that that we've heard about and then there's stuff that's totally new and you, it's very interesting to learn about um, how that all gets applied into policy and yeah, advocating for stuff. Um, a question I had about like the sea level rise is it was really interesting to see that the projection for where that rise is going is very similar to the initial kind of where the bay was. Um, so how much of planning is like relocating really important structures to kind of allow the bay to rise a certain amount versus preventing it from rising? Like how much do you kind of allow for like nature to kind of take its course while also protecting existing infrastructure? This is a very controversial issue because uh, if it depends on what's there. So if a lot of the bay fill was 
um, done so that people could develop it. They could put houses on it. It was to make money. So if there's a neighborhood or a community there, then you have to buy out all of those houses and you know it, people's property values will go down even before the buyout program happens. And property values in the Bay Area right now are just insane. Um, they're very, very high. So nobody wants their property values to go down. Um, so nobody talks about it because even just talking about it, they're afraid that property values will go down. People will get upset. There's a legal thing called a, um, a takings. And that's if you um, somehow reduce the, the value that somebody can assign to their land, then you can actually sue. Um, so if you say something that reduces somebody's property value in some way, like it's actually, you know, something that they can sue you for. Um, so that's very difficult. Um, and then there's a lot of area, especially in the North Bay, that is currently um, wetlands. And that area can remain wetlands, but it is being, they're being drowned. Um, so they need to, we need to add more sediment so that those wetlands can keep up with the additional water. Um, they either need to migrate inland or we need to add sediment so that they can actually, the elevation can keep up. Um, so that takes planning as well. Nothing is just going to be, you know, nothing is just going to magically stay the way it is um, as the sea levels rise. Um, wetlands will transition to open bay or they will migrate upland or they will need some attention to remain wetlands which are actually really critical habitats. And so we don't wanna lose all of our wetlands. Um, so we either need to accommodate them through upland migration or we need to maintain them through sediment. Awesome, thank you. Um, you kind of touched on this a little bit, Dana, but a question I had is more related to public pushback. So um, is your group in particular seeing a lot of resistance from the public or is the public not really aware of what you are doing yet until that's implemented in policy? Or like, I know you said people will sue if you say something to reduce their property value, but is that, are you seeing the implications of that directly or is that um, not something that you're faced with? I would say that it really depends on the community. Um, most people have this, feeling that it's not really happening, it's not gonna happen in their lifetime, and that government is going to fix it before it's going to happen to them. Um, and, you know, governments are trying much, much harder to do community engagement and to get people involved in the process and to educate them on what's going to happen, um, but they still freak out. Um, so this town where, near where I live, which, Half of it is going to be underwater and the other half is going to be on fire. It's crazy. Um, they recently released an adaptation plan and they, I, they did a, a ton of community engagement or they tried to. And when they released it, people were enraged. They were just like, you are saying, and this is a very wealthy community. They're saying, You're, you are saying that my house is going to be gone. My house is going to be flooded. Um, I think when people one thing people don't realize is just because you are pointing out something that um, like flood, like the flooding is going to occur does not mean you are saying you are magically making that house flood. Like you're just sharing the data, um, but it's not, you know, a personal responsibility. Um, but then we've worked with a lot of sort of lower income communities. There's a, a city called East Palo Alto and they know their city already floods. So they're, they're not, their head is not buried in the sand. They deal with flooding all the time. It's probably because they have worse um, flood infrastructure already because they're a lower capacity community. And they also don't have this crazy belief that they're wealthy and therefore nothing bad can happen to them. Um, there's a really great book called um, All We Can Save that I've been reading on, on climate adaptation. And uh, there was a, an article in it about Miami. And Miami is just, I mean, they're completely screwed. Um, because the, 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 um, they're on limestone, which is extremely porous. So not only are they flooding, the water's coming in from below. And, but it's so wealthy. 
And so this author of this piece went there and they toured all these like multi-million dollar condos and they were asking the uh, real estate agent, you know, what's going to happen about flooding? And people literally said like, we are too rich for, for this to happen. Like billionaires and millionaires don't get flooded. And they believe that. Um, they truly thought that their money would protect them um, from nature. So it, it's, it's really quite interesting that the wealthier communities are the ones who actually push back the most. Um, and, and they also, their property values are much, much higher as well. So they have a lot more to lose in, in that financial sense. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's interesting to hear. I'm, I'm not necessarily surprised, but it's good info. Um, another quick question I had was, what was the name of that tool that you said your group developed um, to show the water level rise? Um, it's the Bay, Bay Shoreline Flood Explorer. Bay Shoreline Flood Explorer. Okay, thank you. Yeah, if you Google it, it'll pop up. Yeah, thanks for your presentation, Dana. Um, just as a, a map nerd, I, I appreciated all the maps down there. But uh, I've done a little work with the land use planning up in northern BC, and I was just curious the sort of overlap between sort of the rural planning where you're dealing with more wilderness versus the urban planning, The if you have any experience with that. I, in the Bay Area, it's fairly urbanized. Um, we do have some more rural areas, um, but like right now I'm working exclusively on the Bay shoreline and in the more rural areas, it's primarily um, wild, wildfire issue. Um, but I have done some planning with Mount Shasta, which is like a mountain community. Um, so I don't know if you had any specific questions on, on the differences, like what, I don't know what, if it was like what issues come up um, between rural and urban or uh, just sort of like the the techniques you would use in the in the hazard identification like obviously they would experience the same hazard but you would you would treat an urban community quite differently than a than a uh, forest fire in a sand national park for example I, I would think I think mostly it's the people um there's much different expectations and um the way that they relate to where they live is is very different between rural and and urban and their home means really different things to them at least that's been been my experience um so even the technique is the same like this um the regional resilience toolkit we tested that out in the bay area and we also tested it out in Mount Shasta, which is a very rural community. Um, and the process was the same, but the conversations that happened in the community groups that we that we led had a very different flavor to them. Um, and one of the first questions we asked is, what does your community mean to you? And that's, you know, that's to be able to speak the language that they wanted to speak. And the answers that we got were just vastly different um, between rural and urban communities. Very cool, thank you. All of this led me to think that uh, is there like a very active uh, community outreach or public outreach that needs to go along with all the planning that, that happens in the uh, resilience offices of the cities? Yeah, yes, for sure. And, you know, we're going through this like sea change right now in, in planning in the Bay Area where um, community groups and communities are basically rejecting any planning that doesn't involve them. And this, this really started, um, there was a, a competition um, so in New York after Hurricane Sandy, there was a competition called Rebuild by Design. And then in the Bay Area, we had one called Resilient by Design. And we invited in all these different teams to do planning for sea level rise. And we also had them look at wildfire and earthquakes and it was a multi-hazard approach. And there was so much backlash. Um, the communities were like, 
why are you, you know, just kind of bombing in all you expensive designers from all over the world and telling us what to do in our communities. People were really, really mad. This was probably four or five years ago. And ever since then, the, the communities have just had an increasingly loud voice um, in planning for resilience. And in this process for Bay Adapt, um, we have been from the start trying to incorporate community voices. And we have a um, group that has been working alongside us that has been evaluating our process and evaluating the outcomes at every step in the way to make sure that we are incorporating an equity voice and a community voice. And they're basically rejecting everything we're doing. Um, and that's very different than it was, you know, a couple of years ago. A couple of years ago, they didn't even pay attention to what we were doing. Now they're paying attention and they're hating it, but at least they're paying attention. Um, so it's an extremely slow process. And, uh, you know, I was telling the the informal group that met before is like, I've been yelled at more than I would care to have ever been yelled at in a professional setting about how everything that I'm doing is terrible and that I'll never, you know, do anything right. Um, but this is the process to reconcile traditional planning with actual community needs. Because if you think about it, like, why the heck do planners, who do they plan for if not actual communities? So why has the process been so divorced? You know, why is planning this kind of theoretical, you know, academic exercise that has historically been quite terrible at creating places that actually work for people aside from, you know, rich white men. Um, so it's been a very interesting few years in the Bay Area in terms of this process of resilience planning and learning to engage with communities on that um, and not just engage but have them teach us what we did not know about what communities need and what they want um, out of resilience. I just wanted to draw back on how you said, you said that you guys have had issues because other than permitting you guys don't have like the most authority to implement things. So just on the basis of looking like kind of your trouble spots that I'm just wanting to get like more expansion on. If people with housing properties by the shoreline aren't willing to move, then the next obvious thing is to get them to retrofit their properties. But then, like you said, they believe money will protect them no matter what. And then you've got on the other side, poor communities where they're willing to accept the changes, but financially, they might not be able to do that. So it's kind of like the balance, because like you can't just show up and permit them and it will like tell them to changing. It's kind of that balance, right, with the community. So just managing like those two opposing sides, essentially. Yeah, and it varies by community. Um, and, you know, our permitting authority is extremely limited because we were created by legislation in 1965 and it was really, you know, we can only evaluate projects based on how much fill they put in the bay and whether they maintain public access to the bay. We have no authority to deny a project or, you know, tell a project that it, well, we have some authority to tell a project that it needs to evaluate um, the future resilience of it to sea level rise, but we cannot um, deny a permit um, based on, you know, it not being resilient. Um, so, you know, is that, is that enough? We've, we've looked into whether we need to adjust our authorities to adjust the way that we issue permits and the criteria that we use to issue permits. Um, that's one tool that would give us more ability to um, be a, a stick um, for adaptation. Um, but there are, you know, for there, we're not the only permitting agency in the region either. There are so many different agencies that issue so many different types of permits. Um, so it's, it's, there's just so many different factors at play there. It's a very complex, as I said, landscape of um, tools and uh, players um, that all kind of need to add up to something that gets people to do something. That's very fair. 
And then just on the promoting uh, community quality, I know you kind of touched on that and how like the community is more engaged now, um, but they're yelling at you. But another thing that also in the previous meeting you talked about, like how you had a lot of projects which you brought a lot of attention to and COVID kind of knocked them out. And I'm just trying to think like, cause COVID at some point will be gone. And what are other things that have kind of like interfered that the, you were trying to achieve like community quality, but the community didn't really see where you're going with it because they're too narrow-minded and they're focusing on other problems essentially. You name it. I mean, you know, in the Bay Area, we have so many problems. Uh, you know, we housing is so expensive. And so people are worried about finding a place to live. Um, you know, before COVID, we had extreme traffic congestion. People were worried about their commutes extending to two hours instead of one hour. Um, people, you know, were concerned about finding a job. Like if anything that involves people's day-to-day -day lives is going to take their attention away from something that is more abstract. You know, in the in the in the case of sea level rise, it's something that's down the line. I have had people say, "I'm going to be dead by then. I don't care." Um, or in the case of an earthquake, it's like we don't know when it's going to happen, and so it could happen never. It's going to happen someday, but it's it's so easy to not think about these things because they're not right in front of your face the same way that paying your rent is or finding a job is. Um, so there's always going to be some crisis. You know, COVID was a totally big random one. Um, but once that's gone, there's there's another crisis just right around the corner, you know? Um, even just like, you know, we have other types of flooding wildfire is a huge one we've had so much wildfire in the past few years that obviously takes huge precedence um so it's very easy to forget about these intermittent or long-term hazards that we need to be planning for but no one wants to al allocate the money or the brain space for that and just drawing back to like your you tell you touched on like funding and how difficult it is in general just getting that because of political interest, but you also find that in the specific context of the Bay, one of the other things that's kind of like affecting you guys is that you're trying, you've got so many issues, like from the flooding to the wildfires, to the potential earthquake, whereas compared to like, I know some, I know of some areas where like, it's really like countrywide, it'll be like, guys, our problem is droughts. We have droughts, whereas you guys are kind of like trying to deal with like, other places will just focus on the one problem as a whole, but you. But now you're trying to get funding for, it's not just, oh, we're getting funding for just flooding, or we're getting flood. You need so much money from the is political powers or whatever, like, but at the same time, it's like, it needs to be like separated into different divisions. Yeah. And the other issue is it's just so much money, like the magnitude of, of money um, that we think we're going to need for sea level rise is just way above and beyond any dollar amount that anybody's ever dealt with before. Um, so people just get completely overwhelmed by thinking about billions of dollars over decades, you know? Um, people just can't fathom that amount of money. We've never seen it before. Uh, no, that's very fair, that's very fair. No, thank you. That, thank you for your presentation and answering all the many questions. We have any final questions out there? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Um, I never got a chance to introduce myself at the start, but I'm Aiden. Um, I am one of the um, co-presidents of our subchapter here. So on behalf of UVic Seismic and um, the UVic ERI subchapter, thank you, Dana, for joining us today. And thank you to the SLC as well for facilitating this. We are very thankful that you were able to, to come join us today. Well, thank you very much for having me and thanks for the thoughtful questions. Yeah.